Hey gang, Jekyll Air here. Uh, this past holiday season, I found myself traveling with uh, my family from Michigan down to Tennessee and over to Texas and back again. While we were in Texas, we ended up staying in Frisco. It's been over five years since I had been in the area, and so I looked on Google Maps to see if there were any local places to go. And that's when I discovered the National Video Game Museum, and it was just around the corner. I didn't know if we'd have time to make it there, but when a friend showed up wearing the shirt for that museum, we had no choice but to go. He was nice enough to meet us the next day, and it was a lot of fun to go there. It started with the lobby that had an amazing sculpture showing video games from the past. It also had consoles painted a gold color, which made some of them hard to identify. Oh, and that too, yeah. That's great, look at that. As a museum dedicated to video games, it had to start off with the classic Pong. And it showed many of the different Pong clones that were out there. It also had a giant Pong game that you could also play if you were so inclined. As a side note, just three days before we went to the museum, my sons had the chance to play an electronic mechanical version of Pong. It was just strange. Back to the museum though. It had a great wall that showed consoles through the years. I liked that sometimes the consoles looked like it was trying to blend in and others it was trying to stand out. I was also shocked when I turned around and saw a shirt celebrating one of the games that I have had the least fun playing in my life. Now, the museum does not stop with just released hardware. They also had a great supply of dev kits or development kits. These are the consoles that are for developers to use when they're building games that we eventually play. The Sega CD was my favorite looking one, but the Game Boy ones with an extra board two times the size of the Game Boy sticking out were impressive as well. This display dedicated to Infocom was intriguing to me because I had only seen about three quarters of the games that were in there. Controllers have always played a large part in gaming and they had a wall full of them. You could check your knowledge to see whether you knew what console they were for and what their names were. Typing of the dead on Dreamcast is such a strange thing. I was glad to see it here on display for people to try out. I know it's been released on PC, but it was still nice to see the original. Third party controllers also got some love in this display that had some of the great attempts at reinventing the controller. This case took my breath away. I was holding my breath reading the different games that were just sitting there in a prototype form. I had no clue that this many of them were out there as I don't collect them. For the fans of dedicated electronic video games, they had something for you too. There was an entire room dedicated to portable gaming. The one that instantly had me doing searches on eBay was this Zaxxon tabletop. These five tabletop arcades might be the crowning part in many people's collections, and they are looking as great as they did in the 80s. Turning the corner, we see Game Boy variants on display. Uh, I had forgotten that there were this many different kinds. For my personal handheld journey, I went from Game Boy to Atari Lynx and then Game Boy SP. It warmed my heart to see both of those latter two resting comfortably in the same cabinet, along with the PSP and GameCon. The next part of the museum tries to recreate the feel of the video game crash here in the United States. There's a great display of boxes that have prices that are meant to get rid of everything, and there were boxes in a bin of Atari 2600 cartridges that were all labeled 99 cents, and it was fun to pick through them in the bin. When I turned around though, I smiled ear to ear. They had computers on display that were interactive, starting with the Commodore 64, which was my first computer ever, followed by a TI-99, and then a TRS-80, otherwise known as the Trash-80, which was my wife's first computer. The Apple IIe was up next, and I had never touched one of these up until this trip. 
This Atari 800 was hooked up to a Commodore monitor, and that monitor looked as crisp as I remember from my childhood. The Commodore Amiga was an upgrade from the Commodore 64, and was the second computer I ever owned. The IBM PC XT looked a lot like the computer I started writing term papers on in high school, but I think I had an off-brand version. The Coleco Atom I have never seen in person up until this day, and it was a joy to get a chance to touch it and try and figure out what all the fuss was about. This is the Famicom Family Basic System, and I want to stop here and point out that many of the computers you have seen had tape players hooked up to them. And if you of you may be thinking, wow, mom and dad listening to music while typing, no. Those are what we used to keep our games on. Tapes were cheaper than discs and more useful. So you would type load, press play, and if you were lucky, five to 15 minutes later, you got to play a game. The game with the most ways to play it, if it's not Tetris, is Dragon's Lair. These items all celebrated the game, and it was even there in a playable arcade version. My friend Ryan asked me if I wanted to play it, and I told him I might as well just throw the token on the floor and just watch the attract screen. I love this game, and I'm glad it's still up and running, but I never want to play it again. Then we started moving into the age of connected computers. There was no real internet, but people were trying things. This display with Sega Channel bits and bobs were just mind-blowing. My son had never heard of it, and Ryan and I sat trying to explain this to him, and he could not imagine a time where there was no internet at all, let alone the internet in his pocket. Oh, and turn around and there was a whole second cabinet of stuff. This wall proved one thing that people have been talking about for a long time. How do you display an MMO? How do you display a game that's been patched over the past 14 years? It's an inherent problem with archiving online games, so they just took the box route and displayed a bunch of them. I wonder if 3D glasses will ever work. It seems 40 years of history say no. Ryan and I looked at each other, and said porn at the same time. The Dreamcast was the first console with online functionality built in. And this is one of the three consoles that I want to own. My friend Sonya and I are both obsessed with Hello Kitty and we're okay with that. We saw prototype games earlier and now we get to see prototype consoles. There were some amazingly weird systems in here as well. The Apple Pippin and a Panasonic Q, which is the GameCube with bling. Uh, the CDX down there was an all-in-one Genesis and Sega CD. My cousin had one of those when I graduated high school in 95. Yeah, I am a sucker for orange. And I saw this Key Games VCS, an Atari 2600 clone, and I let out a little cheer. This cabinet contains all the games collectors cannot seem to find. They are some of the more expensive games people look for, but just seeing them is good enough for me. Oh, and yes, that is a stadium event. Okay, so this corner made me laugh, and it is a whole display dedicated to video games translated to board games. And the reason I laughed is because I found like three of these in various thrift stores for around $3 each. And my mind couldn't fathom those things being in a museum. Ryan and I both stared at this for about 10 minutes, reading all about it. This is an RDI Halcyon, and it is a Laserdisc player attached to a computer, and it only had two games made for it, and was going to be voice activated, and cost a mere $2,500 uh, back when Laserdiscs were a thing. This case started out with some normal looking things, but as I looked, I saw the Nintendo watches, and I remembered that I had the Zelda one when I was a kid. I paused on the GameCube because it was just really odd, until I remembered the Japanese love for baseball. That is super cool. Oh, and some Neo Geo. The Video Pack uh, 7200, I have never heard of, so there's some research for me in the future. Uh, the Dreamcast was nice to see. It's a Dreamcast with a built in screen. This replica of my room is scary accurate. I remember this giant Game Boy display from various stores, but they had it working here with a wireless remote and it was really fun to play. My youngest son got up to level eight and was very proud. 
They had more display kiosks, including the Dreamcast, and one for the Atari Jaguar. And the Museum for Video Games ends with an arcade. This place is dark, the games are loud, it's cramped, and there is constant 80s music playing in the background, so it felt like I was back in my local Tilt Arcade. They had a fully functional Star Wars cabinet that looks so much better in person than it does on the video. And while I would prefer Gauntlet 2, I can't fault the original. My sons gave this a go, and then I stepped in, and my son and I got pretty far before running out of time. My oldest son also tried Punch-Out, and I forgot to tell him that it plays more like a puzzle game, but we had a lot of fun. So that covers our trip there. Uh, if you're ever in Frisco and you have some time to kill, go ahead and swing by and walk back through video games. I love that there is a place getting a jump on the equipment in games, so that my sons and I could play the same games that I did when I was begging quarters from my mom at the laundromat. I would like to thank Ryan for telling us about it, and awesome of him to meet us there. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, play on!